just a few quick notes. All right. So um, since we are here in the Zoom webinar, thank you so much. Uh, you can please put any questions in the Q&A um, chat box. Uh, we'll make sure to get to them as the program is progressing. Um, you can also put uh, any comments into the chat box. Thank you very much. Um, you can access closed captioning uh, by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, one thing that's really super uh, important, I want to make sure you all know that you can join us again uh, next Saturday, uh, February 12th at 2 p.m. for another program with Bigger Than Us Arts um, with, with Benoit and the crew as they take us on a journey through African-American music and beyond. It's going to be incredible. For more information about our other Black History Month programs, book lists, and more, visit www.saclibrary.org slash celebrate black history. Um, and since most of us are here now, uh, we've got a little bit of a surprise for attendees. Um, we're going to be um, in honor of this program. Um, the library is going to be giving away three sets of the March book series by the late John Lewis. Um, so if you'd like a chance to be in the drawing, please visit this link in I'm posting the chat here. Uh, just one moment. So good luck. Um, it's going to be random drawing, and we will let you know a little bit later this week uh, who, who, who is the winner. So thank you, and um, appreciate all of you for being here. Um, so with that, I promised that I was going to keep my presence short because we have some incredible guests today. Um, you know, for this program, Why Did We March? We have the Shepherd family, Leon, uh, Dr. Asha Shepherd, and Benoit Shepherd from Bigger Than Arts, Bigger Than Us Arts here in Sacramento. Um, it's a pleasure to open up Black History Month at Sacramento Public Library with this program, and it's an honor. So thank you all, and with that, I'm pleased to welcome the Shepherd family uh, who will be guiding us this afternoon. Thank you, and enjoy. All right, all right. We're gonna get you started with a short little musical musical excerpt real quick from the time. Yeah. All right, man. All right, musical time felt so good, so good. Um, it's. Great to be here with you guys today. Again, my name is Benoit Shepard. I am the director of Bigger Than Us Arts. Um, a little bit about me. I've been teaching music in public schools for about 20 years. Been actively engaging community for the last 10. And been a music, musician most of my life and regularly are working to put music and arts and creativity in the streets. Um, I'm joined today by to my favorite people in the world, but uh, I'll start off by passing over to Dr. Asha Shepard and let him introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Asha Shepard. I am an economics professor at Goucher College in Baltimore, Maryland, but uh, I was born and raised along with my brother in Sacramento. Um, so I still have my roots back home and I'm uh, glad to be here today. All right. And of course, uh, so off to. of course, my father, I call him dad, of course, but you guys will know him as Leon Shepard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My name is Leon Shepard. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. And as born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, it was a part of the South. So we had challenges that most people did not have. However, I had a, a lucrative career in the music, the finance, the insurance, the real estate, and accounting industries. Right. And uh, just to give you guys a little background on kind of how we got here. Um, I know BTS normally does arts programming, but um, of course, it's, it's uh, you know, we talk about Black history all the time um, in our household, but for this month, it's, it was important for us to be able to uh, come and bring up social issues, things that are relevant for culture, and um, because we feel like it's uh, the narrative and it's significant for us to do that and to have our elders be able to come in and do that for us as well. So a little bit about us to help make this uh, make sense is that we, we moved to Sacramento, we grew up in the Valley High community in South Sacramento. And every year, uh, my father, Lee, actually, would walk into class with a cardboard cutout with pictures of MLK and his family. He'd walk in every year, and he would talk to us about it. 
Um, and he did it for, there are four siblings, of course, and he did it for every one of our classes. And we kind of started thinking about it again and thought it was time to kind of bring this dialogue um, in a way um, that we can ensure that we still talk about things that happen and that we can acknowledge and be able to kind of move forward with it. So um, I probably thank you already. Haven't thanked you a million times enough for doing that one. Uh, but but um, wouldn't mind asking you um, why, why, why did you feel the need to go in and kind of do that one on a regular basis? What was the... The, the basis for me to do that was because I wanted to let the children of the day society know some of the issues that was not really put in the history books. So that's why I went to the schools. <laughs> Ooh, uh, appreciate that because um, we we always talk normally about how it takes a village to raise a community and um, really give us an example early. So how this is gonna work today is we're gonna ask some questions. Um, we'll look at some photos. We'll have some dialogue. If you have some questions, you're welcome to chime in. Hopefully we'll be able to um, involve you in some of it. Um, but we can, um, but if not, we'll open up for some things at the end. Before we get to it, I know you're in the chat. I'm curious how active the chat is. Can you tell us if you're from Sacramento, what area you're from in the chat? Or if you're not from Sacramento, let us know where you're at. Just curious how that um, interaction will go. And while that happens, um, okay. Benicia, California. Okay, good. Roseville. Oh, good. good. We're, we're all over the place. Antelope. We are currently uh, in... Um, South Sacramento, um, Valley High area. Um, Ash, I don't know if they know where you're at. Where are you at? Oh, I'm currently in Baltimore. Um, if anyone's familiar with Baltimore, I'm in the Hamden neighborhood. Um, okay. But, you know, actually Baltimore is in a lot of ways similar to, to Sacramento. Um, kind of a smaller city, but has a lot to offer despite being small. Okay. Well, all right, we'll go ahead and start getting into it. And we'll start that by um, asking information. Pop, can you tell us... Um, you, you're born in kind of just a little bit about um, Memphis for why, why did we march? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was born in 1946, so that was a very long time ago. However, the topic of this conversation today is why did we march? And why did we march? We marched for equality. We were brought to this country as a as property. Our people was property. We were not recognized as a human being. And so why did we march? We marched to at least make America respect what was on its paper, that all men are created equal. We didn't have the right to vote. We didn't very seldom had the right to do anything. So we are going to talk about some of the issues that we faced and some of the things that we did during those marches. But the real reason of the march is to equality equality of life, respect for each other. And so that's what started to march. The, the lack of everything in the community started to march. And um, how uh, old were you? What was when you first marched and kind of what was that march that uh, kind of started, you know? The I was in junior high school in the first march. We as a segregated community because Back in the days of the 50s and the 60s, the south part of this country was totally segregated. And so we, as junior high school students, we were a little bit frustrated with getting those regular books every year. And so we got hand-me-down books from other, the bigger schools. So we started our first march at the Board of Education. We had some thousands of children the NAACP and some of our parents, we marched to protest the fact that we should have equal books and brand new books like everybody else. That was our first really, really march is to protest the fact that our schools were not equipped like all the rest of the schools in the city. Wow, wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot, middle school. Right. And even looking at this picture, um, it, it says a lot, it says a lot. You know, we're looking at a grown man um, a, a child and, and a woman. So we, you, the whole community was out yes, doing we, that. And we was out there. We was out there. And we eventually got good, we eventually got new books. A couple of years later, though it took a couple of years, but we eventually got books in our schools that was good, that we could participate in the educational system, which is 
all it was about was getting a fair shot at education because we all know that the key to this society that we live in is number one, education, number two, education, <laughs> number three, education, <laughs> number four, education. <laughs> so it's all about education. Okay. Love it. Um, woo, man. And kind of from there, um, I was curious about, you know, what was the climate like when you were kind of heard about Selma? I'm curious about how. Well, the, well, the, the march for Selma was when this Mrs. Rosa Parks, uh, she had been working hard one day. And I'm, I might be jumping ahead a little bit. However, I'm going to talk about that one because even before the, the situation with the march to Selma, from Tilma to Montgomery, Alabama, we had to, the issue we had all across the South was Blacks were not able, able to sit in the front part of a bus. They were not able to sit up front in a restaurant to eat. And so we had started marching and going into restaurants to sit down at the front, even though we were gonna get arrested, we knew that, but we sit there anyway to get arrested to one day that we would be able to walk in that door and sit down and eat. And eventually that happened. Rosa Parks was an old lady, so she was tired of walking through the back and there was no more seats. So she got on the bus and sit behind the bus driver, which was a no-no. And of course that caused a great big stir and, and she was arrested for that. Now, Dr. King came in and they marched and we marched and we marched hand in hand, walking with the Negro spiritual, we shall overcome one day. Oh my God, I can't tell you how powerful those statements are. And, and, and so that was the, one of the biggest marches was from Selma to Montgomery, just to protest the fact that we couldn't sit on bus. Well, history have shown that the marches worked as we walked hand in hand, so we did that. And so we kept going and we kept going and we kept marching and we kept marching. And marching was always, always about being able to be free, being able to be called a man, not being able to be a piece of property, which we were, we were first recognized as property, not people. And uh, just to recall, uh, how long was that the summer march? That was like. Uh, that march was about four or five days because it was a 54 mile trip. And maybe, now, not mind you, got 8,000 people walking hand in hand, marching down a highway that's not really a good highway. So that took about five days. And a lot of, a lot of police marching right, right beside you with guns, with dogs, with water hoses, all of that happened. But we marched on. We marched on. No matter what they did, we continued to march on. And so today we're talking about it because even in today's society, we still need to do more marching, but that's another story. Okay. Uh, let's see uh, from there. Uh, if you guys in the chat, by the way, if you, if you feel the need to, you know, throw some in there, feel free to do that. Um, we're, we're here. We're paying attention as well. Um, this is a dialogue that we, we talk about these things in our family. And so we are kind of welcoming you here and you know, we welcome you to be part of the dialogue as well. Um, but with that, um, so we talked about the march for for books and, the, and education in Memphis. Talked about Selma. Um, let's get to the garbage strike. Oh well, yeah, that was um, in Memphis, Tennessee. That was some, I guess, sixteen hundred garbage workers, and I think three hundred of them was a part of me, a Caucasian, and the thirteen hundred was black. However, there was a great big difference in pay. <laughs> Pay was different, working conditions were different, and th they never gave them the equal property to work with. And two garbage workers were killed by a garbage truck. And that's when the garbage, the other 1300 decided they were, we had to go on strike because we wanted to be recognized as human because adult, we still was treated as property. And you see people with those signs said, I am a man, we had to let the world know, hey, we stand up as men like everybody else. We just, we're just not property. And so that's how 
the, 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 even though you see guns pointed, tanks there, there was also dogs put on you, water hoses put on you, but we marched. We continued to march. I don't care what they put in front of us, what they did, because we, in 1965, we had the Voting Rights Act finally signed. Even though Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to help free the slaves, it sort of, but we were not able to vote. We were not able to do so many things. So with, with the marching and the Civil Rights Act of 1965 was when they first started to give you a right to vote. And that was black males. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, with that, um, I want um, we prepared different photos and little audio clips. Um, we have a clip of a uh, Jesse Jackson that um, we want to kind of play for you to open the door to begin to introduce um, Operation um, Push to you. So okay. we'll be caught for a second as this clip. Go ahead and play, uh, plays. The significance of Jesse Jackson and Operation Push came on the scene. Jesse Jackson was a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. Martin Luther King was the drum major for justice all across this country. And so when Jesse Jackson came on as, a, as, a, as an associate in marching with Dr. King, Jesse Jackson brought along with him the group where we formed Black Men Pushing. So we were in charge of our own police force for all the actions that took place in our neighborhoods. When the dignitaries came to our neighborhoods, we were the police force for that. We got the cities to allow us to do that. And so that brings me to why I went to the schools to talk about Dr. King, because the story was that this guy, James Earl Ray, shot and killed Dr. King, but that was not quite the story, but We'll go there in a minute. What's the next yeah, yeah. Yeah. So well, I, I want to say a little more because that that's a big thing. So you policed yourself. We said, well, we don't want the help anymore. You right. guys aren't really helping us. They were killing so them. so right. so you said, okay, well, let us operate on our own. And the police department, they they, left, they said, fine, we'll leave you to your own. Is that yeah, they left us to our own. However, they was somewhat present, but they were not up front. So we left us to our own to manage our own affairs. And we was we would we we would we would handle all the dignitaries that came to Memphis as it was black. And Dr. King was our major, major person that we had to protect. And as history have has shown, we didn't do so good with that one. Yeah. <laughs> we lost that fight because we lost Dr. King. Anyway. No, other uh, did the pe were the people, did they Go to Operation Push today. Is that who they talked to when they was was it that kind of thing where they can pay? Hey, mm -hmm. You see, most of the uh, civil rights movements and all of those things back in those days was always headed by black ministers. So the black ministers got together and they went before the, the, the cities to to petition for us to represent ourselves. So it was always about. The, the power structure in our communities came from the black ministry and they were the ones set that up for us. So that's, that was how we got to be able to police up ourselves. And that was how we was able to represent the city when it came to represent blacks as a whole. Now, mm -hmm. so, um, all right, we got another clip. Um, and this is uh, another uh, one of a speech from Dr. King. Um, some of you may have seen it before, but throughout the platform, we think it's important for us to hear these words and to see them as they were spoken at the time. So, We've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in minutes. I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. I left Atlanta this morning and then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brother? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. 
But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Okay, now you can. Woo! And while that was uh, playing, there was a question posted. I think it's relevant. Is uh, what are some of the ways you protect yourself from getting hurt while protesting? Well, we knew that we were going to get the water put on us, and we knew that we were going to get the dog sick on us. But what we did, we marched on. Hand in hand, we marched on. We got, so we didn't care about getting hurt. We didn't care about going to jail. We didn't care about being thrown in paddy wagons on top of each other. We did not care because what we wanted was to be able to be a free person. So as far as protecting ourselves, that was never a thing that we even thought about. It wasn't important. Did you have another question? Yeah. No, so so thank you, Shelly, for that question. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for your comments as well. Um, but I do want to get to, you know, we started to talk about, uh, you know, the assassination and then, okay, that, that day there and um, oh, just yeah. how many people were around. Can you tell us about, just a, a little about that day? And um, yeah, I, I guess that for all of us, that day was probably the biggest shock of all because there was thousands and thousands of people in downtown Memphis. And at this Lorraine Motel, which was a small motel at that, it's still a small motel, even though they call it the Civil Rights Museum, it's still a small motel now. And, but we didn't even know that Dr. King had been shot until he fell over, almost fell over the, the banister. And when people started grabbing him, because it's no way that if all of those people, that shot had to come from up above a long ways away. And so that's why I went to the school to tell the kids that, wait a minute, they said this one guy did it, but there's no way that one guy could have did that and got out of, and he got all the way out of Memphis, Tennessee, all the way to Mississippi before they arrested him. But they took him there. They was responsible for what happened to Dr. King. That's, that's, that's a lot. That's a, that's a, <laughs> so we didn't care about, our, about ourselves at all. We cared about the future. And that's why I talked to you today. I, I still care about the future. Wow. And, um, you know, I think about this all the time and we talk um, and we we look at things now and, and we, we talk about then like we remember. Um, we talk about like we remember it, but um, we still don't want to talk about this in some classrooms on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it also puts the context, you know, for, for me and Asha, I may ask you as well. Um, as people this that are active this generation now, because we all take community engagement pretty seriously, that um, I know we didn't expect to get to this point and still have to be marching as hard as we do, but our work is not done. And um, <laughs> being how I had an example, somebody who I was watching, you know, walk out and actively do those things, uh, that you know, the our concerns of today, um, the answer to that is for us to continue doing the work. Do you know what? Yes, guys, we cannot stop. We can. We never can stop to everybody until until the we get all of America to recognize what America put on paper that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator 
with certain things that have been the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, I don't know if America's honored that what it has on paper, even today. And, and, and that's the struggle that we had to do. We had to bring it to them, their attention, just to get them to see, hey, wait a minute. What happened here? So No, and I, um, the reason that, again, why we're even having this conversation is because the narrative still needs to be present. That's correct. And that's right. something that Ashwin and I may chime in for now is what it was like for us because that narrative was present. It was the youth have to see this message um, because it helps it helped me um, help me find my, my path. Now, all of these things um, watching you do and talk about let me just say, OK, community is what it is for me. I care about community. I'm going to find a way to do that. Yeah. And now we do parades like we we actively did that. But I only could do that because these messages were being sent to me. And as we think about how to, you know, push our youth the same way, this is a portion that they're missing that that doesn't help them buy into the culture. Um, I'll pass it to, to Ash and see if you, if you have something to chime in with that. Yeah. So so for me, you know, uh, you know, father said it, that education was really the key to, you know, the future generation. It was like they said, the first strike, the first march that he participated in was to get better books because understanding that a proper education um, will set you up for future generations. Because I remember one of the lessons that our father taught us was that, you know, yeah, they can stick dogs on you. Yeah, they can stick the water hoses on you. They can put you in jail, but they can never take away what you know. And you build on that across generations, what we know. And that was one of the reasons I became a, uh, a professor and then a teacher, uh, because that message of spreading knowledge and education to the younger generations, um, you know, that's that's kind of my way of, of fighting the fight, of expanding our knowledge, expanding our history and, and still talking about it and keeping it relevant. Uh, that is how the future generations will come to know what has happened and how we can learn from it and how we can be better. But again, the key is coming from education because that's something that can never be taken away from no matter what they may do to your body. What is in your mind belongs to you and hopefully to the future generations as well. Yeah. And, and, and this is up. So we got another question from Shelly. What are some tactics? I'm so, sorry. What are some tactics that you used back then that we could use now? Well, you can always march. Why did we march? We marched for equality. Why did we march? We marched for, for freedom. Why did we march? We marched for justice. And why did we march? We marched for that we can all be treated the same way. So what it can be you today, we can continue to march. We can continue to protest, but we have to continue to march and protest in a peaceful way because you cannot be violent and get anything accomplished. So the answer to it is to continue to look forward, continue to move forward, and continue to look straight ahead regardless to the obstacles. Obstacles stop you, then you, you, you won't get very far in life because there's always going to be obstacles. And so if the obstacles are going to be the part to stop you, then you don't need to start a protest because there's going to be obstacles. So the safest thing I can say is, like I started with this whole process, the safest thing I can say to everybody today is, I don't know why that the history books does not take note all of the contributions that was made in society by Blacks as a whole, but we can educate ourselves. We can educate our children and our children's children can be educated because education is the key. It's the tool that can be used today. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. I want to recap that a little bit too, okay. because that, that's a lot, do you know, to right. of, of what do we do? We educate and we're present in our communities. It's like the, those, those things were what it was then now. And, and even it, oh, sorry, what it was then, and especially what it is now, um, so I get, we all we all have to continue to educate and we all have to continue to push. Um, and that's, am I getting that correct? That's what you pretty much were saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Even though they send the education system, it, it is what it is. The education system is what it is. So what, even though it might be certain kinks in it, but we still have to go with the best that we can and keep going forward. Go and talk to your elders. Yeah. That would be my suggestion to everybody. Go and speak to your elders 
and they would give you some insight as to what's not in the books. Yeah, and I'll also add that, you know, education is a full community thing. The educational system is, is, can only be one part of it. Like for now, for those of us that engage in community, we, we know that the, the entity of public education cannot bear the ground, no matter what they say, no matter how much we, so there has to be something in school, there has to be something in the after school programming setting, and if there's a religious thing or something, it has to be there, but we just, we have to figure out how to add to the education system, because it was a village that raised a child before, and so we still have to get back to that one. Um, yes, but how should the church be the educator, but everybody doesn't go to church? But it's not, it's not, it's not supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, no, no, that's why my suggestion is that whatever you can pick up in the school system, yes, but I still say go to your elders, go to the elders of the community and talk to them. They will talk to you. They will tell you what happened. They will tell you what they had to deal with. Just like I'm saying today, what the obstacles that we faced, we did not care about what happened to us. So the steel thing and how you do it today, you cannot care about the what's going to happen to you. You just have to present yourself as a vessel for change. And, and that comes from the heart. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. it's a vessel for change. Yeah. Oh, uh, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and, you know, we had a talk. We, we drove to LA um, a little while ago and we had a talk um, that came back to character counts <laughs> oh my god you know um oh, ca character counts we, we 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 do we it was mentioned in the content of character we, we, we hear it in the i have a dream speech a character counts and we began having this dialogue um that we do not have a political problem um we have a people problem and because the thing is that you know where we are forgetting that things are people and the lines that people are drawing between us do not exist so people are promoting that, hey, we're, we're different, we're different. No, we're more the same. When we view each other more as the same, then we can find some common ground and find a way to push forward. But the, the narrative has been shifted from us and it gets us away from just thinking about, hey, are we just being good people to each other? Right, that's correct. That's all about, it's all about how, we, how you treat each other, how you treat your fellow man, because that's how you want to be treated. So that's, that was the whole Bison room. It's all about people caring about people and not caring about what, what your nationality, what you look like, how big you are, how small you are. It's about the character of the person. And it's about the character in you that you will stand for something other than disparity. Now, um, we've, uh, we're breaking up, sorry, we've been breaking up a few different ways. And we're going to play one more short musical example for you. And the reason that is, is this, this comes from a place called Stax Records. Um, we'll talk a little bit, very, very briefly, just about that as we come back and continue to wrap up. But um, we do want to give you a little snippet of some music that was being used at the time. Um, and as that's queued up, um, we do have to address that. How do people deal with it? Positive forms of expression. The music that was made at this time was significant and felt good for a reason. So, all right. This is Sam Moore of Stacks. Too long we don't have that much time <laughs> yeah. being being black history month uh why we we chose Stax records because Stax was a black owned record company that did quite a bit in the communities in those days so that's why we put that up there but i see we have quite a few questions mm -hmm. and i want to see how many of them we can get that get through before we have to wrap up so let me see you got one, Ben? Hold on, let's see. We'll talk a little more. I think we might have addressed a couple. 
Okay. So while, while we have a couple more come in, um, I do want to, Ash, I, I want them to kind of hear about um, what you do with economics and policy and kind of how you feel that kind of fits into um, our, our journey through education kind of back here. Cause that- Right. They, yeah, so um, like I said before, I'm a uh, economics professor, so I got my my uh, my degree in economics, and what I do is what you call is a, a applied policy research. So I look at how education policies that are enacted have different outcomes for different people. And the reason I got into it's kind of you know what my father was talking about is how is, can we contribute to change, and seeing how powerful education was, I wanted to look into how education affects people, particularly young people. Um, and so my research is about the effect of education policies on uh, criminal behavior. So, because one of the things I observed was that, and you know, this has been documented. Yes, not everything's equal. Yes, the education system is not perfect, but the more education, the more high, the better quality education that people get, the less likely they are to uh, to commit certain crimes. Um, and again, it's thinking about what can we do to help benefit society and just to show, you know, my research, the whole point is to show that, hey, if we at least can progress through the school system or at least in a way educate yourself in a more tangible manner, yes, the school system is not only to educate yourself, but it is one of the easiest things to measure, right? Did you finish? How far did you go? Did you go to high school? Did you go to college, right? So how does that affect your trajectory? So crime is not the only thing I look at. It's just how is your trajectory affected by education? And it's the signs are pretty clear, right? Like my dad said, education is the key, right? Uh, getting a proper education, whether it's just school or not, can set you on a trajectory to, to better yourself. It just gives you more opportunities, right? And that's what, what this is about. That's why, we, that's why we marched, right? It's to give ourselves opportunities that we were denied previously. And one of those things was just the right to go to school a good school or just the right to have new books. That's why they marched, uh, one of the first marches my father participated in was just to get good books, right? Because we know the power of education allows you to access things that we were previously denied. And so by accessing those things, now we have a chance to not only better our lives, but also the future generation. And that's why our father read always and still in us, you know, education, 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 because, you know, we're his kids and then they're going to have grandkids, we'll have kids, all these things. So the future generations, they can stand on our shoulders. And one of the ways they can stand on our shoulders is us providing to them kind of a blueprint of how to navigate. And you nav you learn to navigate by educating yourself. No, yeah, that's... <laughs> I appreciate that one. And it's funny how far we come, like even with this dialogue, um, that, you know, we go, hey, you march for books. Now we're at a place to where we forget to encourage our community to, to even read. The library has great books that they're even giving away. They put a link up earlier and they'll put one up at the end. So, cause we have, you know, these resources. So we, to, we try to be back just to remind us that, hey, we have this wonderful resource of knowledge and information that people had to work for. They had to, they had to they had the march and fight all those things just for us to have books. And so, it's a great um, re um, reminder and chance for us to even be able to have this conversation. So I can't thank the library enough for doing that. Um, but I just want to make sure we kind of remember that how far, even just in this dialogue, it kind of is. Well, and I, as well as this dialogue was, was such a, a, it's somewhat limited because we can only touch a small basis of what really took place in this society that caused us to, actually do all those marches because even there was one, I didn't even mention the late, great John Lewis. Oh my goodness. They, John Lewis marched and they beat this man. They beat him unmercifully. You couldn't even know, you wouldn't even knew who he was for the beating that he took. But why do we march? What did we care about the results? We didn't care. They could beat us. They could pile us on top of each other. They could put the dogs on us, but we didn't care. We went forward for the betterment of all. Even John Lewis in his last days, he was still fighting for the equality of the people. So, I mean, 
it's just so many other instances. I mean, mm. if I could go back and even think about the issue with, with Emmett Till, with Malcolm X, uh, with so many others that was present and so many things happening as, that didn't make sense. So that's why I, I, I hang my hat on the word of education. I'm, I'm never going to walk away from that because education is the key for tomorrow. Education is the key for yesterday. And education is the key for today. Okay. Right, I do see a couple questions okay. um, here. Uh, Malcolm X um, had a different method than Dr. King. Yes, he did. What are your thoughts on him? And did you follow one or the other more? I followed Dr. King to the T. Um, Malcolm X was... Even though I like Malcolm X, but Malcolm X was was preaching a different theory. He was preaching, if you got your weapon, I'm gonna bring my weapon. But we know that you can't outgun people that have tanks. So it has to be about peace. It has to be nonviolent. And so the difference between Dr. King and and Malcolm X. Malcolm X was not about nonviolent. Malcolm X was about fighting. Dr. King was about nonviolent. And that's and if you're gonna have any success in anything in this world, let me tell you, nonviolence is the only key. Nonviolence is key. You can, I mean, you 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 can think that maybe you got a big gun, but they got tanks. You can think maybe they you can get a tank, well, they got anti-tank. Missiles. So it's not about a war. It's about peace and, and education. So that's why I followed Dr. King. And never would have been, a, even though I like some of the things the Muslims spoke about, because they was about betterment of, of Blacks as well. But I was not about violence. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, next question. Um, now we have an issue about censorships of books and ideas. Do you think this is something to rally around, um, need organization around a specific issue? What, no, mm -hmm. yeah. So oh, do we think uh, that we should rally? Go ahead. I was going to say uh, the answer to that, well, my opinion, excuse me, yeah. is uh, don't let them. Uh, this is one of those things where you got to fight it. Um, you know, obviously, like my dad said, now with violence, you got to fight it. You can't, you can't allow... Uh, these people to shut down the access to knowledge right um i forgot where i was reading but there was a, a set of books that was getting banned somewhere the thing is we can't stop yelling about that we can't stop screaming about that like do not take away our access to history our access to information whatever these censorships of books and ideas are they're going to be censored. that's something that is just we oh, cannot right. allow to happen um because again if, if we shut ourselves off from what has been done and shut ourselves off from access to education, then we are allowing history to repeat itself. Um, and that's definitely something we cannot do. So that is that is a matter of making sure we yell and scream and kick the, down, kick the door down, so to speak, not literally, <laughs> but kick the door down on things like that to not allow the censorship of knowledge. Right. That, well, that, and, is, and, that, is, that is very, very dangerous to allow the censorship right of and to the access of education and knowledge. We must both like uh, vehemently <laughs> protest and and uh, you know fight for that, right? So that, that's something that we just cannot have. And I cannot stress that one enough. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we have the power because because we can tell these stories ourselves. Right. Like you know the obligation gets back to the like people, community, like and if, your elders. Yeah. And your elders. Go to your elders. Talk to your elders. Mm -hmm. Always talk to your elders. And yeah, yes, books I sensed it, but what do we have as an alternative? Now, I have a question is, with Dr. King's absence, who, who do we have in that could take that place today? Who knows that's the question? <laughs> that's, that's a really, really, that's a really loaded question. I'm going to challenge the person that put that question out there to take a look at that man in the mirror <laughs> and start there. Or woman. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, it's, 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 it's literally yeah. not there. But if who we can we who can we go to today to direct us? Look in the mirror. Start there. And once you start, there will people will join you. Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, no, no. No need to apologize for loaded questions. That's no, why no. we're here. No, 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 no. So, no. Questions are good. So <laughs> questions are good. Yeah, that's 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 why why we are here mm -hmm. to, to, to start to talk about these things. Um, we um, have it. We still haven't found ways to accurately have conversations or even set this up. So even just us having this dialogue mm -hmm. is substantial. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we're here with our family now is just because that's what we know. We know that you're, you have stories. We know that you have mm -hmm. tales. We know that we are not alone in this. We're just we're just here now. <laughs> and we always want to encourage um anyone to speak up we are allies on these calls with the sac library with ricardo and all these things to, to continue to find ways to vocalize our concerns our history and, and the knowledge that we know that is required to for this world to be a better place going back to that question on what do we do when they censor us we just we have to keep oh. saying the truth yeah. out loud because the over youth have no chance over and over and it has to be peaceful it's correct. So over and over, peaceful march. Okay. All right. So um, with that, I think we, I do want to, I, I know we keep asking questions, but I know there's so many random things. I do want to say, is there any, any other random tip, anything else you wanted to uh, uh, kind of hit on? If not, that's all. Uh, the only thing that I would want to leave people with and, and understanding is that in America today, we still have a challenge. We still have a a serious challenge going on with even voting across the country. If people have paying attention to the news in the last year or so, we got states ratifying things in their states that was determined. They determine who wins the election, not the voters. So we still have a real serious battle to go on even today. However, don't stop. Don't stop. We got to fight and you're going to stand up you're going to stand in peace and you're going to go forward. That's it. Keep keep going forward. Well, all right, we're going to take uh, another second. We'll leave you one more audio clip um, and then we'll come back for a couple more minutes um, and then we will chime back in. Again, as the, that clip is being loaded, um, we want to say um, thank you. We appreciate your time. We still have a little bit of time left. But we're getting close towards the end. Um, I want to say how significant this is for us to have this mechanism to talk. And uh, we will let you listen for a brief second to Mr. Uh... So uh, got another question um, in the chat that we want to pop to. Do you think um, we need more people of color in government governmental positions? You better believe it. You better believe we need more people. However, how do we get there? We start with education. Start with education, and that's how we get. If you get educated, then we can probably back you up, vote for you, and, and put you there. But we have to start with education. But yes, we do need it. And it's always going to be uh, until that day that we have a totally equal society, which I don't foresee that in my lifetime, but in my grandchildren's lifetime, that could be. So that's what I stand my faith, my faith on. All right. We have, uh, you know, only have a little bit left, but what about, see, what's some say something about stacks. Uh, yeah. So. Stacks, stacks, stacks Ray. The question is, would be great to hear about uh, your time at Stacks or just a little bit about it when you were there. My time at Stacks, though, it was probably the best time of my life was working for Stacks Records. Had Stacks Records never closed, 
there will be no Dr. Asha Shepherd. There will be no Ben Moore Shepherd <laughs> because I never would have left Memphis, Tennessee. Be it was really a great company to work for. And we sold records all across the world. So it was, it was magnificent to say the least. You go to work every day, music playing every day, you're running into artists every day. It was it was outstanding. And it was, and needless to say, the pay was off the charts. So and it was all black, it was black owned. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, the pay was yeah, pay was off the charts. So, the, so that's what I most my most impressive thing with Stacks was how they paid me. <laughs> okay, so and how old were you when you worked there? Whew, I would say my late 20s, man. I think 25, 26, 27, something like that, because I came to California about 28, something like and, uh, that. And they don't know, but after Stacks came to California, who did you work for when you came? I came to California to work for Motown, Motown Records, which was so much different than Stacks, but that in itself is a whole nother, whole nother can, story. Can you tell us just the, the, the basic difference between the two? <laughs> the basic difference between the two was Stacks was owned and operated 99.5% black. Motown was black figurehead and operated 99, about 90% 90 outside of the black community, wow. even though the money was made in the black community. So that's the big difference. And I don't want to break down that anymore. Right yeah, now. no, that's, a, <laughs> right, that's, right, a, right. Yeah, that's, that's another talk. With. <laughs> right. That's a great big talk. Yeah, yeah. That. So we, we have right. to get to some of the specifics okay. uh, of, of some of that. So what is, um, that? What is that one? Say? Uh, it's just a comment saying um, I can see how um uh it was for sacramento youth and how benoit is doing amazing music oh thank you thank you I, that was a compliment for me okay. <laughs> what compliment for you okay. for raising me we um close to push we have back. we have about uh about four or five minutes left um with that i do want to make sure that you do um Support the SAC Public Library. This programming and the program they have throughout the month um, is significant. Um, and we know, we all know that the things that we talk about now span beyond this month. This right. is just That's a mechanism right. that allows us to get to more freely. So remember, we continue to um, do these things on a regular basis. So BT Bigger Than Us Arts is here on a regular basis. We do these community things. We support in a lot of ways. If you would like another presentation or some kind of performance um, from various people throughout Sacramento, um, please feel free to kind of let us know. Um, our goal is to support positive force of expression. And, and for us to do that, we also have to acknowledge truth and ownership of presence and place and be willing and, and open to help um, anybody articulate what they need. Um, Peace has been the, the narrative of the time and um, finding good ways to deal with it um, is just kind of vital. Uh, Dr. Shepard, I'll see if there's anything else you want to chime in with as we um, wind to a close. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody who came out and listened to us. You know, uh, one of the reasons this came about was me and Ben were talking about how fortunate we were, along with our siblings to grow up with these stories. And a lot of people just don't ever have access to them, you know? And again, it's passing on knowledge of what, what has occurred in the past. And I'm just glad that everyone uh, had a chance to hear uh, these stories. Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. Um, does a, uh, there has a question for you. Do you study schools in Sacramento? Um, I currently do not. We're working um, on that. I'm trying to I get have, I have, I'm working on, I had, I did do a project a while ago that was studying um, the effect of school starting age policy. So how old do kids need to be when they start, uh, how that affects a lot of different outcomes. I did study, that was all of California. It wasn't specifically in Sacramento, um, but I have, you know, me and, and Benoit talked about hopefully in the future we can, because, uh, you know, Ben has been involved in the, you know, uh, Sacramento school system, what, 13 years, about 13 years? Yeah, yeah. About, that. yeah. about 15 years. And, you know, BTU Arts is in the community, has been in the community for a while as well. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do do some work together. Yeah, uh, cause There's a lot of great things that BTU, and I know the Sacramento Public Library, I know that BTU is going to be doing some things together as well. Um, I, I mean, even without doing the work, I know there have been, it's beneficial. I can tell you that right now. Um, yeah. But that's definitely something in the future, hopefully, we can get to. 
Um, I think they'll. I think I'm gonna put the link in the chat for the speak uh, for the talk next week. Um, we do see you guys asking about that. Um, so feel free to come see us then for next week. Um, there will be various excerpts of various genres of music, and we'll talk about positive forms of expression and the examples that have been given to us through various styles of African American music. Um, so it's a, another great presentation. Um, so feel free to kind of chime in. Um, and we kind of look forward to seeing you. Also, um, the library also does have uh, some great books and stuff for you guys there. I think um, Carl may let you chime in if you want to check, you want to touch about that survey. You want me to? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, in honor of this program, we have um, three sets of the uh, March book series by the late John Lewis, an incredible award-winning graphic novel series. So um, if you hit the link right there, you get a chance to enter in our drawing. Good luck. Uh, we'll let we'll let the winners know um, if uh, how, how to get those books here in the future. But um, I'd really just like to thank you all for this incredible opportunity um, to share the space together, to open up this program um, for Black History Month programming in 2022. Um, it's really been my pleasure. Uh, Mr. Shepard, uh, it's so nice to meet you. Benoit, it's incredible thank to work you. with you. Dr. Shepard, it's always uh, a pleasure to meet someone uh, who's got so much knowledge and is doing work, um, to use that knowledge to utilize some incredible community building work. So um, with that, um, thank you everyone and everyone who's who's been here, it's an incredible experience. Keep an eye out um, for more opportunities next week. Benoit is gonna take us on a really great musical journey. Uh, there's another program happening with the Sacramento Room at the end of the month, uh, we're talking about history today. Uh, at the end of the month, we're going to talk about Black Futures. Uh, we have uh, the incredible Miss Unicorn, also known as Space Walker, uh, Sacramento's uh, eclectic uh, and incredibly talented musician. Uh, it's going to take us on another journey into the future of what music and what culture is all about. So with that, um, I want to say goodbye and thank you everyone for being here. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what do you think, Beth? Let me see. All right, it's Chancellor Lopen. Are we still live?